Okay, good afternoon everyone. My name is Josie Warden. I'm a senior researcher in the economy team here at the RSA and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon. This is actually the last of the events programme before we break for the summer, so you're especially welcome today. Um, just before we get started, please can I ask you to make sure that your mobile phones are switched to silent. We will be filming today and live streaming over the web, so welcome to anyone who is joining us online. Um, and a reminder too that the hashtag for today is RSA Inequality. So with those bits of housekeeping out of the way, it's my pleasure to welcome today's, best, today's guest, Danny Dawling. Danny is the Halford McKinder Professor in Geography at the University of Oxford and has written prolifically on a range of social issues from health and housing to education and employment, wealth and poverty. He's a solo author of no fewer than 17 books and co-authored dozens more. His most recent book, which we will be discussing today, tackles the key issue of our time, inequality. And he's visiting today to argue that we have reached peak inequality in the UK and hopefully he'll tell us a bit more about what needs to happen next. The book draws together a range of new material and recent publications um, from, from places like the FT and the Guardian. And in doing so, it shows the complexity and the interrelatedness of the issues, but also offers hope that constructive change is on the horizon. So the format for today is that Danny will short, uh, speak, the short, speak shortly sorry, for around 20 minutes and then I'll have a few questions for him before we open up to, uh, to questions from the audience. Um, definitely encourage anyone who doesn't normally ask questions in this forum uh, to please think of something during the session and do raise your hand afterwards. Um, so we have lots to delve into uh, before we uh, get started. So please give a warm welcome to Danny Dawling. Uh, thank you ever so much for having me. Uh, for me, this is a kind of uh, end of an era, if you like, an era in my own little life. It's the end of your season of talks as well. I've been looking at inequality for several decades, and I've been writing books on it for 10 years. And if you like, this is the end of a series of books. Um, about a quarter of it is completely new. Uh, the other three quarters of this book are articles published in the last five years. And the last five years saw an incredible rate of change. When you look back at it and look at things we were complaining about in 2013 or 2014, in 2013 I was complaining that very elderly women had lost five and a half weeks of life expectancy. And I thought that really mattered. Uh, now we know that overall the entire population saw 5% mortality rise in the last year. In the last two years, uh, babies in Britain have been more likely to die, and more likely to die again than the year before. And you can get very used to this kind of thing, and that's part of the reason why I thought I'd put the book together to show how shocking it is. Uh, this graph isn't from the book, it's from one of the other books, one of the ones done earlier, because it's a kind of trilogy, or more than a trilogy, and the graph is just showing you various peaks for some of the richest countries in the world. There's a misconception that inequality in the past was always high. We had a brief few decades of greater equality, and now we're back to normal. Uh, that is not what the data show over time. Inequality goes up and goes down and goes up and goes down, and probably has for millennia. Uh, people get very angry. Societies fall apart when inequality rises. Something happens. And the interesting question for this talk is, what's that something now? And inequalities then begin to fall. People fight for them to fall. It doesn't just happen naturally. You reach a state where your equality levels are relatively high, and you forget. That's the problem. You forget how bad it was, and you forget to fight hard enough to stop it getting bad again, and it rises again. And you get this kind of thing. Um, the bad news, is anybody from the States in the audience? Okay, the, the bad news is that um, I'm only talking about Britain. As yet, there is no sign of inequality peaking in the US, and the US is one of the few countries of the world that's, the rich world that's more unequal than us. Um, but sustaining high levels of inequality is very, very difficult and very, very expensive and very dangerous. Here are two countries that illustrate how inequality can rise or be high. Japan managed to sustain a very high rate of inequality for quite a long time before the Second World War. It requires a series of beliefs about your society and beliefs that people should hold certain positions in the society. 
Uh, you can think that it's always going to be like that, but if the Americans drop two atomic bombs on you, invade and redistribute the land as equally as possible because they are scared that there will be a revolution as occurred in Japan, you create what becomes the most equal large country in the rich world, with all the benefits that brings, the highest life expectancy uh, in the rich world. If you look at the little dots at the bottom, you can see a small rise recently in Japan. That really annoys Japanese social scientists. They talk about how terrible it is, and in Japan it is terrible. But we can only dream of having the kinds of levels of equality that Japan has. The little triangles in the graph are the same figures for Germany. And you can see the rise in inequality in Germany in the 1930s. When inequality rises, it is dangerous. Uh, equality wasn't opposed, imposed on Germany to quite the same extent. It was imposed on Japan, but it was imposed by the invading forces. Every city had a purpose. Berlin was no longer going to be dominant. In fact, a wall was built through Berlin. If you want to wonder what it would stop to stop London being so dominant in Britain, and often think that short of actually building a wall halfway through London, it would be quite hard uh, to do it. But again, quite low levels of inequality. And it's not just by losing a war that you gain great equality. Here are the Netherlands and Switzerland. Slow, steady work. This is the take of the 1%, but all the statistics show you the same thing nowadays. We used to worry about different measures of inequality. There's no need. They've aligned. Uh, this is the take of the 1%. And you can see in Switzerland, bubbling around about 8 or 9%. Swiss bankers are paid half as much as British bankers. Doesn't make them any worse at bankers. Um, you, don't, you don't. Oh, good news. April the 18th this year, the first big reported fall in bankers' salaries, by the way, uh, from, from two years ago. The European Banking Agency collects the salaries of bankers across Europe, and they have been coming down for at least two years. Because you don't need to pay people lots of money to be in London if you're trying to persuade them to move to Dublin or Frankfurt or Paris. Um, but we're going to find all this out. Uh, that's just to show you that you know, inequality can fall, can be low in very, very civilized places. The other little table there, as I rattle through, is the OECD League Table of Inequality. And in case you didn't know where we are, it's the latest statistics of 2015. The most unequal OECD countries are Mexico and Chile, although inequality is actually falling in Chile and will fall now in Mexico, given the politics there. Turkey does very badly. You tend to get despots when you have high levels of inequality. The United States does badly. You tend to have despots as you get high levels of inequality. Um, <laughs> Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia always bump up. It's always one of them, and it's small sample size. They're actually are not as unequal as that, but I won't bore you. Uh, with this, but it's interesting in that countries which uh, had in effect been invaded by a communist power have a bigger taste for inequality than places uh, that are more used <laughs> to less turmoil. Russia, high inequality, despot in charge. Uh, United Kingdom, uh, I don't think May is a despot. <laughs> I think we're kind of lucky in a way, but you never know, we might get a despot soon. So all those people who want to take over instead of her. And below us, Israel. We're more unequal in terms of income inequality than Israel. That's the kind of society we live in in the United Kingdom. That's the difference between how we respect and pay different people. This is Israel, including all the people in Israel who are not seen as being Israeli. They're included in the statistics. Uh, the league table at the bottom, I won't go through because there's just so many countries. That's what's normal. Uh, and there are 12 countries I couldn't fit in, but the Netherlands in the middle. Um, these are sensibly functioning places. We are the most unequal large European country. I am calling it the peak. I'll show you, I'm afraid, a few more graphs as I rattle through. But I'm calling it the peak because I've monitored these things for a very long time. And in the last couple of the years, just too many statistics came together. Uh, the pay of FTSE 100 CEOs dropping on average about 18 months ago by about a million each. And you can worry, are they finding another way to pay themselves? But in fact, the pay of the highest paid CEOs dropped more 
and the pay of the men dropped more than the pay of the women. Uh, and that's just some of the very highest paid people in Britain. HMRC are late releasing the statistics on the 1%, but everything we get, including those banking reports from Europe on the salaries of our bankers, suggests that the take of the 1% has been falling for three or four years. And you then begin to look at the very top. This image was taken in 1914. It's the Harrow Eton annual cricket match. Uh, the boys, for those of you who don't know, um, who haven't been to Harrow or Eton, uh, the boys are clearly Harrow boys, uh, because Harrow boys have a cane and a hat. Uh, Winston Churchill was a Harrow boy. Uh, How do you get into Harrow? You require a dad who's been to Harrow. Well, there's dad on the, on the bottom row. How do you get into Eton? If your dad went to Eton, they put your name down at birth, um, which is useful, because if we're doing s tests of selection, we know that most people actually get in in that way. And there they are on top of the world at the height of the empire with their mothers, with their bits of bird in their hair. And that's what a peak of inequality looks like. The statistics show that year to have been the most unequal, year in which the most common job for women was to work in service. And it was normal if you were like these lads to have servants. And within a few weeks, what was supposed to be a very short war began. But it wasn't just a war. It was a revolution in Russia, and it was the activism of the trade unions, and it was the rent strikes, and then it was another war. The peak isn't necessarily a good point to be at. I'm afraid that's the bad news from today. But at least if you are at a peak, you're not facing things that look even worse in future and an even bigger fall down. Two graphs. This one's a 10%. Let's do a little survey. Think of your own income how much you get a year before tax. Uh, think of your partner's income if you're in a couple. Add the two together and come up with a number. If your household income, you and your partner, is 75,000 or more, put up your hand. OK, we've got some reticence, because I know it's double that. But that's pretty good. Well done. OK, uh, that, you're in the 10%. Welcome to the 10%. Um, actually, in London, far more than 10% of people are in the 10% because London salaries. And I do not believe that an audience for the RSA, anyway. <laughs> but <laughs> whenever I do this, I get reticence. I did this talk at the RSA two days ago, and admittedly they're students, but it was amazing how few people were in the 10%, given that, I don't know, about a third of all Londoners are in the 10%. And who comes to lectures? Anyway, <laughs> well, I, won't, I won't go on about it. I often threaten audiences that we're going to actually sort everybody by income. <laughs> I know, it's, it's, you know, this is how you know it matters. But it's a secret. All you've got to do is quietly tell your income to the person next to you and swap seats if yours is higher than theirs. <laughs> and we just do it 10 times. And then we can see to what extent it's age. Who's the young person being paid well? Who's the old person who's not getting quite as much? It's all very painful. Um, there is the big fall, that huge achievement. Here is the rise in inequality up to recently the top 10% taking about 40% of all income, leaving 90% of people with 60%. Conservatives, of which my favourite is Philip Hammond, like to claim that inequality began falling in 1990 because they ignore the top 10% in their statistics. Um, I won't say more about that if you want to ask. And there you've got the 1%. And if you're thinking, look at those top 10%, those greedy people taking 40%, that's terrible. You've got to remember the top 1% are taking 15. That only leaves 25% for the other 9 out of 10. Everybody feels badly off. You'll notice a wobble down, up, and a wobble down, a wobble down, up, down. And this is, this is what the peak feels like. The peak is hard to gauge. It's hard to be able to tell when you're at the peak that because there's a cloud ahead of you. Is there another peak ahead of you? Are you on the way down? When you know what's happening is when you're going down. In the 40s and the 50s, it was absolutely obvious that the country was coming together and it was becoming more solid and more normal. And in the 1980s, particularly the late 1980s, it was absolutely obvious that we were climbing up the slopes of inequality. At the trough and at the peak, it is much harder to call it.
1936, 37. Same cricket match, different picture. One of the most famous pictures in social science appears on the front cover of at least four social science books. The two lads from Harrow no longer looking quite so cocky. The three working class boys looking a bit happier with themselves. 1937 wasn't a great year. Mass unemployment, and for those in the know, if you went to Oxford in 1937, they told you the war was coming. For those in the know, another war was coming. That's what it looks like 20 odd years after a peak. It's not necessarily going to be a land of milk and honey, but it's a change. It's a change we, we get. If what happens in future is similar to what's happened in the past, it will be different. I'm stopping all the graphs now. I have many, many more, but there's no need for them. What is the point at which you would call it the peak? When did inequality hit its highest point in this country? The graphs, in a way, are like a pile of sand, with the bottom of the pile being carved out, hence equality for the poor rising after 1990. At the very top of the pile of sand, the person, the employee, with the very highest income in the country was Mr. Martin Sowell. Mr. Martin Sowell had a dispute with his employees, employers, and is no longer the head of WPP. Um, so the date of his resignation is, for me, the possible date of the peak. I'm going to give you a very brief summary of the seven parts of the book in five minutes, so I'll be quick. But there are many things which are peaking. Politics. Politics begins to behave differently. It did last time we were past the peak. Uh, a different interpretation than you normally get of swings. This is from uh, Fraser Nelson. Tony Blair in 1997 got an 8.8% swing, but that was after 18 years of conservative rule. It wasn't really a swing for him and his cufflinks. It was a swing against 18 years of conservative rule. If you want evidence that Tony's not that great at getting votes, the next two elections under Tony Blair, negative swing, minus 2.5, negative swing of 5.5. You've been told a very different myth about the amazing Tony Blair election winning machine. It just doesn't fit the numbers. Poor old Gordon Brown, and he did have a worldwide economic crash as well, but minus 6.2. Not very good for getting votes. Nice said Miliband worked really hard, 1.4% swing, positive. Not bad for a Labour leader. You've got to go back to Attlee and Wilson to see what you would do if you're really good. And of course, you've looked at the line at the end and the biggest, fastest swing in the history of British polling uh, for a man who can't string a sentence together and is even worse at talking in public than I am. And that <laughs> in just two years. Um, that's unprecedented. If you need something else to see it, here's the segregation index of the Conservative voters all the way from 1918. Back in 1918, Conservative voters were clustered in some parts of the country. You couldn't find them in other parts of the country. Come together, you can find a Tory everywhere, spread out all over the place. Your neighbour might be a Tory. Over time, and there's a little switch in 74, the segregation index rises and rises and rises. Places become more conservative. Other places become more Labour. The country pulls apart. You get a kind of map like that for London until... June 2017, when places that normally vote Conservative saw a fall in the support for the Conservatives for the first time since 1974. Was that bumbling man with a beard, you know, appealing to Conservative voters? I don't think it's that. I think the times in the world are changing. I've put that map up partly because I'm in London and I challenge you to spot Barnet. And I won't say any more than that, but if you know your London politics, um, the story was all about Barnet. You can't see Barnet on the map. Labour did extremely well in the local elections of this year, other than in Barnet, which you can't tell on the map. Other peaks. House prices. Uh, this map was produced by my colleague Ben Hennig, who's hopefully watching this from Iceland, if the live feed works. Uh, it's the first map produced of the fall, the first fall in house prices. August 2016, using data from Zoopla, we managed to work out 
who had lost the most equity in the tiny falls that followed the Brexit vote. I think the whole map only adds up to a billion. A billion is half a street in Chelsea. Um, you know, so this was the first time we'd actually seen a pattern of sustained falls. But as you may know, if you're a homeowner or got a mortgage in London, this has carried on. We don't like to talk about it. We want to kind of pretend it's going to go away. But for two years now, the housing market has been peaking down. Much more important things have happened. The timing of these things matters. But the reaction to these events I think shows you that you're at a different time. I don't need to say anything about this picture. I just need to show you this picture. And you know exactly what this picture means. I could have shown you a picture from 2005 of the BBC reporting bankers buying a bottle of champagne for £30,000 with a £10,000 diamond in it. But they're still drinking away £20,000 to celebrate a deal. And that was presented by the BBC as good news because our banking sector was doing so well. Different pictures tell you different things. The mood of a country has changed. You don't notice the mood changing because you're part of the changing mood. You think everything's still bad, it's terrible, they don't get it. The Conservative Party are now proposing three-year tenancy agreements. George Osborne raised tax on landlords. So far, they've abandoned their programme to introduce thousands of secondary moderns. Um, you know, things are actually moving and stepping to the left. But you're in the middle of that movement, and so you don't notice the movement happening, and it's just the beginning of it happening. Not everything peaks. The average age in which women have children hasn't yet peaked. It, of course, has to peak. I've checked the latest data for 2016. It's not an iota of a peak. There is a limit to how old you can be having children, so it's, you know, it's not just a, an indicator of your economy. Why did it do this? Remember, the most common job for women is to be a servant. If you're in the attic, you can't have a baby. The servants disappear by then. There are many other reasons. Contraception matters, but there are lots of patterns related to economic inequality. The other graph is my only global graph. Um, world population growth peaked around about 1968-71, and little inset shows an acceleration in the decline in fertility recently. There are lots of interesting global stories about different kinds of peaks, but that's the end of the rest of the world. Education. I won't explain the graph. You can have a look. And if you're not from the UK or USA, you may understand it. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> leave it at that. Um, student debt. We introduced £9,000 fees at the height of the peak, the highest fees in the world. Went up a little bit, now being capped, can't go down. We have a political party, the major opposition party, dedicated to ending fees and loans for new students the day after an election. I can't think of a more effective campaigning slogan uh, than that. And the third largest party, uh, the SNP, of course, wouldn't touch fees and loans. By the way, the last time our third largest party was a Nationalist Party was 1918, and it was Sinn Féin. There were loads and loads of signs that now is a really interesting time. Health. I mentioned this early on. Uh, about two months ago, Jeremy Hunt stood up in the House of Commons and said that there is no evidence that there is any decline in life expectancy or any rise in mortality. And then the Office of National Statistics produced a report to say we'd had the most unprecedented recent rise after five years of terrible, terrible news on health. And thank God nobody had the gall to try to blame it on flu again, because they've been telling us since 2012 it's a really unusual flu epidemic. 2012, 13, winter of 14, 15, 16, every bloody time. And they, they have some shame, and they've stopped that. The Department of Health, who has 24 press officers, keep on trying to say it's ageing. The ONS figures take out the effect of ageing. I do think at least half of the 24 press officers need to be reassigned 
to something more useful. They don't have to defend Jeremy Hunt anymore. He's now going to be a much better foreign secretary than the last one. But <laughs> would be remarkable if he's worse, wouldn't it? He's got something to aim at. Um, this doesn't happen in peacetime. Doesn't happen in peacetime. Hasn't happened anywhere else in Europe. One year in Germany, there was a fall in life expectancy when over a million war refugees from Syria turned up. Um, luckily, I don't have enough time to get angry enough to go on. Um, but it is ridiculous. The picture on the front of the book and these little pictures I'm showing you were taken by Christian Buss, a lovely photographer who was taking a picture of these young people at the Occupy protest who were trying to enter the Lord Mayor's banquet uh, and were stopped by the police who were not as amused by them as I am. Um, I'll read it out for you because I just think we should remember this is 2011. In David Cameron's speech at the Lord Mayor's banquet, he said, was his Prime Minister, that he now had an opportunity to begin to refashion the EU so it better serves this nation's interests. You have to remember he said that. That is the kind of way we thought back then. We're going through a really, really good learning experience at the moment. We are finding out what we are worth. It is going to be a bit of a shock in October and November. They're trying to be really careful with us. They're trying to be really calm. They're trying not to look at us with pity. Um, it's really hard for a country in this situation to face the reality of what it's worth when it goes to a bargaining table. But that was the kind of, wasn't just the attitude. That was the attitude he was happy to share in public to serve this nation's interests. I mean, no wonder we end up in this kind of mess. And it's only at these times of incredible peaks of inequality that you get politicians to say this. Politicians from more equitable countries are shyer, careful. They don't boast. Partly because their voters are not impressed by that kind of behaviour. And one problem is because they don't boast, the Prime Minister of Norway never gets up and says, look, we've got the lowest child poverty rate in the world. Why don't you copy us? Because the people running countries that are more equitable don't go on about it, we're very good at not noticing. The last graph. If you think it's impossible and there's no money and you can't possibly fund the health service, you can't have state schools without cuts and so on and so on and so on, this is the proportion of GDP we spend on public services, which is almost identical to the proportion of GDP that we tax. That's the austerity to come, and you might say that inequality could peak a bit more with that to come. I'm hoping that the wages to the top are actually going to fall faster. A normal country spends between 45 and 50 percent of its GDP on its public services because that's what you do if you want them to work. Uh, we are down at the bottom. Our debate between Labour and Conservatives uh, is about one and a half percent. It doesn't even get us to Spain. The discussion we have about how could you possibly vote for Jeremy Corbyn, you can never spend that much, it would be socialism. Socialism's a long, long way up. Right? We're playing a tiny game of moving in a tiny amount of space on that particular graph. The rises, by the way, are the bailing out of the banks that occurred then, and the fall in GDP. But in a country like Finland, when GDP fell and Nokia went uh, bust and so on, or didn't do so well, they increase the spending on public services because you don't let the standards of your children's schools or your hospitals fall just because your country's become a bit poorer. You have fewer holidays. Imagine thinking that. Imagine, imagine thinking that that is a decent way to behave. And we're a long way. We're two, three decades from that. It's my last slide. Uh, and I'll leave it on so that you can read it. I won't read it out. Uh, the reason for putting it up is I wrote an article in May 2016. Very, very long article for a blog for the Labour Party. I'm not a member of any party, but I like the Labour Party. And I wrote, wrote them a really long piece about how Jeremy Corbyn might not be the worst thing in the world and ten reasons in particular why not. And the editor of the blog, who I don't think liked Jeremy Corbyn at the time, but I suspect 
has moved a bit, picked out um, one quote, not from me, but somebody else I'd quoted, called why, which read, why Corbyn's moral clarity could propel him to number 10. And without asking me, put that as the title of the piece to take the mickey of how silly this academic in Oxford was being, writing all this stuff, saying a politician with the lowest expenses, a politician who actually believes in what he says, might not be a bad thing. That doesn't happen to me anymore. That was just two years ago. Things are changing rapidly. And finally, if you're thinking, but the people with money are really going to hold on to the money because that's what they're doing, you're right. And in general, these things don't have a turn without a war or some other disaster that makes you poorer, which means that the rich can't be so rich. Then you need to think, well, what kind of thing are we going to engineer which is as near to a war in terms of the effect on our economy that might involve thousands of civil servants being reallocated this week and next week in government departments right now to Brexu and to Dexu and so on in a wartime operation in case of a hard Brexit. And it's as if somebody sort of got out and said, look, this country doesn't change very quickly. We really need something that's going to shake it up. Let's engineer a very, very bad economic disaster, because at least that might shake things up. And the people with the most won't be able to carry on telling you that you've got to let them have all their wealth and all their income, otherwise you're going to be impoverished. I think the thing has turned. That doesn't mean it's going to carry on. Every time this has happened elsewhere, it's required effort and fighting and agitation and reminding people about what it was like a few years ago when the Director General of the BBC was paid much more now than the Director we have today, when bankers were paid much more than today. You have to remind people what the attitudes were like before the fall, how people reacted then to a fire in a council block, and whether it was just one of those things or whether it actually showed you there's something deeply wrong with your society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Danny. I think it's really interesting in your book you come back to a kind of recurring message around this idea that we don't always see change as it's happening, but then once it's happened, it seems inevitable, and also that we kind of change our, almost change our memories and feel like we were part of that change. Why do you think that happens, and how is it how does that kind of impact the way we act? And does that need to change, or is it just an inevitable part of that process? Um, I think it's part of being human. Uh, we are incredibly adaptable. The, the, some of the best studies of what happens if, if one of us has a terrible accident this afternoon, you won't now because I've told you, but you have a terrible accident this afternoon and you lose two or three limbs, we know that within two years you will have largely adapted to that change. Um, so, so we are adaptable. We adapt to a war. Within a year of war being declared, people were in the mode for that. Um, and I think we have to accept that we are very good at forgetting and we're very good at adapting. The trick in the book, there, there is an optimistic section in the book, I should say. Uh, the last <laughs> section seven, 14 chapters of optimism. Um, and the reason, the way I, it's an old trick, um, I pretend I'm 100 years in the future and look back at what we do now, which will be seen as, as ridiculous. And it isn't hard to do. Um, in my childhood, in my school, the headmaster in my state school would cane people. You know, it was child abuse. That was banned, but you could pay extra money and go to a private school. And for many, many years, you could ensure your children were beaten. Um, <laughs> you know, and what you've, got to, what you've got to do is you've got to think, what is it today that we are doing that somebody in 30 or 40 years' time will say, do you know, they thought that was normal. Uh, and and it's, an interesting, it's an interesting game once you begin to play it. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you about that as well. Um, why did you take that approach? And do you feel that's a way of kind of communicating to people in a different, in a different way that they're kind of currently hearing? Mm. Um, I hear so much um, fatalism of, you know, your fantasies, Danny. How can you believe that those with the power and the money 
will give it up. Um, they will fund campaigns to get what they want. They will buy the newspapers that are given to most people. It's impossible. And, and it's because I hear that so often. Um, and particularly from students who, you know, obviously all they know is what they've learned in about 12 years since they, they started uh, watching what was going on. Uh, the saddest thing is being in a school. It's actually Winchester School. Being in a school and talking about what it would take to not have homeless people on the streets. And a boy saying, but there's always been homeless people on the streets. And I suddenly realized, this is a boy, at, you know, you're talking 30 grand a year to go to Winchester. But that doesn't, doesn't mean that you don't see homelessness. And, you know, I just feel there's a real need to say it is entirely possible, not, not even possible, apart from Japan, under a particular kind of era for several decades, in almost every case, when somewhere has become as unequal as this, equality has uh, been won in two or three decades afterwards. That's just normal. We'd have to, we'd have to really go for Empire 2.0. We'd have to really go to become the Singapore. Um, we'd have to get Jacob in charge. We'd have to invite the billionaires in. Uh, we'd have to create a special new kind of non-dom status. We'd have to stop sending half of our young women to university, because that's bad, because they might think they can think. <laughs> we'd have to rapidly reduce that. We'd have to stop people being taught in school so they didn't, you know. This is not in the interest of 99.9% .9 of people now. Um, I, I can't help being optimistic about it. I just, my pessimism is, don't think that in five or ten years' time, it will be great, uh, because that has never happened. And those very rapid increases in equality, losing a war or having a revolution, the years after that are not much fun for a lifetime, an entire lifetime after that. What do you make of um, potentially people looking to kind of older inequalities in this time of change? So I'm thinking about Trump or Jacob Rees-Mogg or Boris Johnson, even things like the Royal Wedding where people are kind of almost harking back to something which is yeah. traditional, traditional kind of hierarchies and inequality. What do you think that might say about what, what's currently happening? Whether, whether, whether at a time of great inequality do you get an increased affection for being in charge by strong men, that kind of thing, and, and knowing your place. I mean, I showed you the, the little rise in Germany. Um, the far right tends to do better when people feel they're doing really, really badly. I uh, once heard somebody do an amazing speech uh, which appeared to be a speech about today, about uh, UKIP going round and looking after you and caring about your house and so on. And when she finished the speech, she then told the date it was, which was um, Berlin in 1938. And everybody in the room had thought she was talking about Britain. Um, so th that's the scary thing. Uh, the data is actually interesting. The New York Times has been measuring far right votes across Europe for many years. And it produced graphs every so often, the far right's in bright red, um, and the graphs are scary. But if you look at their graphs over time, in most European countries, most of the time, the far right are actually declining and have declined in recent years. It's just that whenever they do well, when the AFD gets whatever it was, 14% of the vote in Germany, or in Austria, somebody almost becomes president, we focus in on that. We never focus in on the kind of pushing away, Golden Dawn goes down. All the European countries with no far-right party of, of any size. Um, I'll give you one last very nerdy thing on this. Um, we look at European elections, and we should have seen this, but we didn't. In 1979, there were no far-right parties standing and no votes. The same in 1984, every five years. In 89, I think the NF got a little bit about 1%. Um, you can go forward and it rises and rises. The key date is 2014. In 2014, the Conservative Party was out of its normal Conservative bloc in Europe, hadn't yet entered something new. And with UKIP and a few other ones, you're looking about a quarter of the population voting far right. But then if you go back to the very most recent European election, the Conservative Party were aligned in a group in Europe with the Polish Law and Justice Party, 
and an AFD neo-Nazi MEP with our Conservatives. Our Conservatives are not Conservative as far as European politics is concerned. They've become a far-right party. And if you added the Ulster votes to the, some of the Ulster parties and UKIP and some of the small fascist parties and the Conservatives together, 50.5% in people of Britain who voted, voted for a far-right party at the last European election. But we never saw it like that because we're in the middle of this. And so for us, the Conservatives are always the Conservatives, they're not the far right. And for us, Labour is always Labour and on the left, even under Tony Blair as it moved and moved and moved, because we're in the middle. And so we don't notice the shifts. And the same happened before when we became more equal. You know, we didn't really notice the Conservatives in the 1950s trying to build more council houses than Labour. They were just trying to get votes, we said. They were actually trying to build really decent free bed houses that the family could live in. Um, our political parties don't differ that much, even now, between each other. They all move together as a pack, and it's the same in other countries. Merkel is to the left, I think, of Labour in this country. We don't think of her as that, but can you imagine us letting a million Syrians in? Can you imagine us having trade union leaders on the boards of companies? Um, can you imagine us having a situation in which business people don't fly but use the trains because the government makes sure the trains work? You know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, and that's part of what I'm trying to do is to say uh, we have our imaginations harmed um, by the situations in which we're in. We can see it in things like how good people in this country are at maths and other things. Um, one way, apologies to my American friend at the back, but one way I, I illustrate this is quotes from the USA, from Texas. I collect them. And you can, I don't know, something about Texas. And you, and you, can, um, you can put these up and an audience will kind of laugh or be a bit scared of some of the things that are said. And then you say this, you can do exactly the same thing if you go to an audience in a normal European country and put up some quotes from this country uh, of what we say. And then it's not so funny. Yeah, it's really important to have that context, yeah. how we fit into to everywhere else in the yeah. world. OK, I'm going to open up to questions from the audience. So I'm going to take two at a time, and there will be some roving mics around. Um, who can I go with first? Any more hands going up? OK, can I go for this lady here, and then this gentleman in the centre here, please? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Danny. That was very thought-provoking. I have two questions, but I will only ask one. One is about financialization and the link to inequality, and the other is about wealth inequality, which is, you know, kind of the income's the tip of the iceberg in reality. So financialization and the link to inequality. So you have someone like Jeff Bezos of Amazon who goes to bed at night and wakes up $200 million richer through no productive effort of his own, just through capital stock appreciation and you know, the wealth of his portfolio. And then you have people in, in the UK, in London, who are uh, at, the, at the bottom, uh, you know, 50% through the financialization of housing that is causing people to lose their homes, whether it's social housing, social cleansing. Um, and then you have private equity firms who are basically predatory, eviscerating high street firms uh, because of asset stripping. So you've, you've got incredible instances of um, financialization which has really seeped into our, yeah. our, our world. Uh, how on earth do we tackle that uh, when we see uh, you know, how it has really permeated so much of our, our lives today? Um, do you want to take the second question now? Or? No, no, I'll, um, I'll do that because it's okay. one question. My memory's not great. Like I say, everybody else's is, but mine isn't good for memory questions. Um, we look at how other countries handle it. Uh, other European countries tend to actually have higher rates of innovation, uh, produce more inventions. Uh, Wi-Fi wasn't produced in this country. Um, Finland, 25% of their workforce works in manufacturing, even after Nokia did worse. But the people running and owning these companies don't take as much. So we need to learn from the, those countries uh, that do it. You're right about wealth. Wealth tends to lag income about two decades. So long after income inequalities fall, uh, wealth inequalities fall. But it's possible to have quite decent societies 
even with quite wide wealth inequalities. I've got one example. I'm waiting for the lawyer's writs for this one, but I'll, I'll keep using it until he sends me a letter. Um, Richard Branson owns one of the largest estates just north of my city of Oxford. If I get in my little kayak and I go up the Charwell, when I get to the Branson estate, that's when the uh, trees have been felled across the river, so I can't go. Um, I don't mind Richard owning that estate, but I want the law changed so that we have the right to roam across it, and I want him to have the duty to build the footpaths and cycleways across it and to keep the river clear. But he can still own it. And if that sounds fanciful, that's what national parks in this country are. We just don't have one in Oxfordshire. Uh, and that just requires an Act of Parliament and the designation of a national park in the south of the country. There are 2,000 lakes in the county of Oxfordshire, and I can't swim in hardly any of them. And I'm getting old, and I want to. Um, <laughs> so there are ways in which we can control people's wealth by that for, to do with property. We can simply ensure that uh, they have responsibilities um, that go along with it. And then it doesn't cost the state anything to maintain those footpaths and the cycle paths. We've got more bikes in Oxford than almost anywhere else in the country. And you can't cycle out of the city and not risk your life. Um, this is entirely solvable. So I'm David Wood uh, from London Futurists. I want to ask about the scenarios by which we might get out of the present uh, peak inequality back towards a, a less unequal society. You mentioned in the past it, often took terrible wars, and you portrayed another terrible scenario in which we ended up with a lot of austerity because of a, a bad Brexit. Mm. Is there a, a nicer way in which we might avoid uh, such an outcome and, and go a, a transition more based on people contemplating this and saying and drawing back yeah. at the last minute? And I mean, you said you're a fan of the Labour Party and you but why is it that so many of the leaders of the Labour Party are still pursuing this uh, pro-Brexit scenario? Uh, if they would uh, change their colours, I'm sure they could have a, a much faster turnaround, at least. Then. Well, that's my wishful thinking. Yeah, they could, they could possibly. I think it's definitely worth presenting people with the option of saying, uh, we have a target within 20 years to be the average for Europe by inequality. Not to get to the top of the class, but this is where we're trying to get to. House prices in London are going to have to fall between 1% and 2% a year to get us there. We've had a government whose target has been to get them as high as possible because they saw that as economic success. Um, and you could say where, where you want to actually be and be brave enough to do it. I mean, I think they, they've actually, the current leadership and the very interesting shadow cabinet, which is a great experiment in... What happens if you give a political leader no choice over who to put in their shadow cabinet? It actually turns out they're quite capable. Uh, whereas we always say in the past, oh, you couldn't have them as, you know, shadow foreign secretary. Um, I, what I think the Labour leadership are doing on Brexit is every four months moving a step towards the softest possible and changing the position. I don't know whether they've decided that's what they're going to do, but if you look at the switches, uh, that's the way they're heading. But they just don't want any of it on their hands. Um, this should be entirely owned by the Conservative Party. There's another great misconception, which is that it's poor Labour voters. Uh, the majority of people who voted leave, the middle class, the majority live in the south of England. So there are more people who voted leave in Hampshire than all of Stoke and Sunderland and the rest of it all put together, but nobody goes to Hampshire and says, what were you thinking of? Um, the, the signal for Leave voters is Tory voters who are not rich. That is your, your median, normal Leave voters. Um, so it isn't a huge issue for the Labour Party. But the vast majority of the half million Labour Party members want to stay in the EU. There's one last thing to say on staying on the, in the EU. We're currently in on a very, two very unfair terms. One is an opt-out negotiated by manufacturers so we don't actually pay. We don't pay what we should be paying in. Uh, but there's a much more unfair thing we do, which is unlike any other European country, we take more young, educated people from the rest of Europe than somebody else has paid for their schooling at a high rate because they tax people properly. And we take them in after 
they've got to 18 or 24, we don't pay them badly and get a lot out of them. And at the same time, we send disproportionate <laughs> numbers of our elderly to die in another European country. Um, both, both Dick Cleggs and, and David Cameron's parents were out somewhere else. Um, I'd love it if we could get together. Well, if Theresa May wants to go down in history as much, much better than Margaret Thatcher, what she needs to do is battle on through the summer, through the October, to the party conference, and walk into a party conference and say, I have tried everything. I've had two hours of sleep for the last two years. I've done everything in my power, and it will not work. And for my party, and for my country, and for whatever, I sent a letter yesterday, revoking. I don't think she's got the guts, but imagine it. Um, and that she has the power. Jeremy Corbyn could send a letter, and it's meaningless. Uh, but she actually has the power to do that. And she also potentially has the self-interest because this could tear the Conservative Party apart. Political parties never last forever. Um, the last time the Conservative, they're talking about it now, you know, that last time they fell apart, but they reformed. That's rare. You know, there was a silver lining to Brexit. Hard Brexit could actually be the end of the British Conservative Party and possibly also the British class system, which is a very peculiar, very expensive, very odd thing. I'd still prefer it if she sent a letter, but I'm not completely desolate about leaving, about not sending those MEPs that we send who cause so much trouble. I'm quite interested about what the EU 27 will do when we're no longer meddling and telling them they've got to be a capitalist club. Uh, and I, I am not utterly pessimistic, but I am storing up some tins of beans. <laughs> <laughs> On that, uh, next two questions, please. This gentleman here, and any other hands, lady at the back there. Oh, Thank you, Danny. Could you comment on inequality worldwide, particularly Africa and Australasia, and whether, if there is any equality there, is to do with the British influence? OK. Um, the, the poor old British. Um, if it hadn't been us, it would have been somebody. I think one in seven of all carbon atoms in, in the atmosphere were British, actually from our, our coal. And we disrupted more people in more places around the planet than anybody else. So when you look at world population going from one billion to about seven, that was us. Um, parts of the, of the world had stable populations before we turned up. Uh, but it would have been somebody else, he says, or somebody who's English. Um, the, the measurements that I've looked at the latest UNDP figures, they show falling inequality in most countries in Africa. The, the problem is in that you have people who were in the past said to be on subsistence income, who were living off food they were growing, who enter a city and have a wage, and they're said to be better off. So it, it is very hard to do, and I won't pretend to be an expert uh, on it, on what's, on what's happening. Uh, but certainly, uh, our colonization cannot be painted as a great thing when you look at the life expectancies and you compare places that we colonised to other places. The, the other colonial powers, the French were brutal in Algeria, the Belgians were absolutely awful, so we're, we're not the only one. Uh, Australasia, Austra Australia and, and New Zealand have high rates of inequality. Uh, English-speaking countries in general do, um, and it may be an English disease uh, that it's high at the moment. It's also that the companies between these countries move around. Uh, these countries have high rates of advertising. Advertising helps increase inequality. You don't think about it, but it, it makes the poor buy things they don't otherwise need or want. Uh, advertising spend in this country is 4% of GDP. In the mainland, it's 2%. It's partly because they're more sensible in the mainland, but also you've got to double the adverts. But you produce an advert in English, and that can spread around the English-speaking world. And if you have a political philosophy which is espoused in English, that travels far more easily. And the other thing we, we should look at is if you're a country that speaks a language that is only <laughs> spoken in that country, say Finland, 
it is much easier, I think, to see everybody in your country as more like you, including the people who come from abroad but learn Finnish. Whereas if you're a country that happens to speak the world language, it's very easy to see other people as strangers because you don't have that thing in common. Okay, and at the back there, please. Uh, brilliant John. Uh, Danny, um, I am... Um, in looking at you, I'm interested in sort of the, the why to your what, because you brilliantly described um, how these cycles work over time. And, um, and um, so the why would be what motivates people, like, for example, you, you, the, the, the example you laid out with Theresa May, if she presented, and what would motivate her to do the right thing, for example. And, when you look at these graphs and your example about looking like 50 years back and saying this was crazy what people used to do. But if you extend that time by your own admission, what might look crazy 30 years hence might be the norm 80 years hence because of these cycles. And it's just human behavior. And I don't know if you explore sort of human motivations in your book maybe we're uncomfortable, we're comfortable with equality until it almost kills us, mm -hmm. and then we engineer wars or Brexit and that kind of thing. So um, yeah. when things are smooth, is there something that human beings should be thinking that, well, never again should we have this, so therefore we need to implement mm -hmm. a sort of strategy to keep it smooth and not like yeah. troughs and peaks. Okay. Uh, thanks, it's a very good question. The what is easy in a way, which is why I mainly work on the what and why I produce graphs. Um, you know, because it's, it's not that hard. You've just got to get the numbers and data and present it. The why is harder. I mean, why did Britain become the most unequal country in Europe? My best guess, because we could have gone a different way in the 70s. What happened in the 70s to us that didn't happen to other places? It wasn't the trade unions. It wasn't the, the sickness. It w we lost the last colony. But we never told ourselves that the colonies were so useful to us. We got a bounty. Nowhere else in Europe lost that amount of money. We partly joined the European community because we didn't know what to do, uh, because suddenly we weren't making much money. We made money by forcing people to buy our cotton. We made money earlier on by forcing the Chinese to buy our opiates. Every Chinese school children is taught that. No, no children in Britain are taught that we were one of the world's biggest drug uh, so that's part of the why. On the motivation, there's a book called The Inner Level by Richard Wilkerson and Kate Pickett, and that's, that's what you want to see for the motivation. There appears to be a variation amongst human beings. 80% of us are pretty pro-social, get on, empathise with other people, about 20% less, 1% are psychotic and are very, very dangerous. More equal societies control the greedy. More unequal societies actually laud the psychotic. Um, say, look at them, look at that, you want everybody to be like, like that. If that is the case, and there's hundreds of papers now on, on this that suggest that we, we have, and we're born with it, it's random, it's a random, random, not inherited. If that's the case, it, then it will be with us for decades and decades in the future. Um, but we can learn. In the 1920s, there was only one person in this country who knew about level of inequality because there was no measures. He was a young PhD student called Hugh Dalton, who later became Chancellor of the Exchequer in 1945. But only he actually had the numbers. And in his PhD, he says, this is interesting. He had no idea how interesting it would turn out to be. Um, this information is now known around the world. The OECD produce reports. They're not a particularly nice organization. They're you know, promoting competition to do this. They've changed a bit. The OECD produce reports saying how bad high inequality is now. So we're learning collectively, and I think we should be able to control in future. But I mean, if you look at you know, the First World War, one problem of high inequality is you end up with a small group of people in charge who are particularly unusual, particularly self-driven, particularly estranged from the rest of society, and have the ability to make really, really big mistakes. And that occurs in unequal countries because the group at the top become more and more rarefied and to get to the top. In this country, if you want to become an MP, the amount of money you acquire or have to raise 
you know, is, is very high. You can't just choose to do it. It is really hard. In the States, you really have to creep to corporations to get the cash from them. You have to sell your soul. In somewhere, a small European country, where I go on physics because I'm a university academic, and I'm having a drink with a lecturer, and I say, what were you doing 10 years ago? They say, oh, I was a member of parliament. But I got voted out, so I'm back teaching again. Because small European part countries, like all the rest of Europe, they have PR, so you've got eight to 12 parties. That requires an enormous number of candidates and people and normal people, or academics at least, um, <laughs> you know, take part in politics, whereas we have in an unequal country a separate professional political class. I mean, one reason why the PLP is so annoyed with Corbyn is they see this as their job and their right. And the idea of going back to a time where you might select somebody who was born and grew up in the constituency to represent it, rather than somebody parachuted in, um, you know, is seen as terrible because if you believe in inequality, and I'm talking about the Labour Party and the PLP here, if you believe that only a few people are able, and you must just have those few able people, they tend to have gone to my university, by the way, in, including in the Labour Party, then you can't possibly have a candidate for your constituency, he was born and brought up in a constituency. You must have somebody who did PPE, who's worked for IPPR just around the road, you know, who goes to talks like this. And then they can go and represent a small northern town that they might have visited once <laughs> as a child. Um, you know, greater equality gets us away from that and, and gets us to what is normal. It's, it's not a fantasy. This is what you... You can go to any country in Western Europe and get a sense of what it's like to be more equal. They're not utopia, it's not perfect, but in most cases, everybody goes to the same school. Imagine not having to lie or pretend not discuss where your children go to school. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll ask one more question before we wrap up. Um, a lot of the information and the data can seem very overwhelming to people. How, what, what can we do, what can us as individuals do to support the change? You can do better than me, I'm afraid. I, um, I was doing a talk earlier this year in Dublin, and I just put up one graph. It was simpler than that last one of spending. I only had one for my whole talk. And I put the graph, and the person comparing the talk went, that's complicated. And I thought, oh, no, I failed. That was supposed to be, you know, the really simple graph. Uh, so I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not good at this. Um, lots of people can take these messages away and do a much better job than I have done of explaining what has happened because it isn't known, um, explaining the, the differences, producing things which are digital. Anybody under 25 doesn't look at paper things that much anymore. And they don't watch the telly either. If it's not on YouTube, it doesn't exist. So put it on YouTube. I can't do that. Somebody can do that. But also simply discussing this. When, you, when you're... I've written the blog reads about what can you do. And it goes on and on and on. Uh, because it says you can just retweet. One, one retweet a day of something you like. You can write a letter to MP, does, it goes on and on. <laughs> or you can just raise an issue at Christmas that you might not have raised, you know, with that relative <laughs> who you're trying to get on with. Don't have a huge <laughs> argument. But the next time that they tell you that there are too many people from over there over here, just say, I don't agree, and leave it at that, and put that tiny bit of doubt in their head. And if you do anything like that, you're doing better than the average person in the country at the moment. And I think saying that's, that's possible um, is enough. And it's what happened last time. Um, John Maynard Keynes had a friend called Oswald Fox. Oswald Fox was a banker. And Oswald Fox said to John Maynard Keynes at the height of his kind of power, as the world was changing in the 30s, economics was changing, he said, you know, you're, you're great general theory, John, it, you know, it's, it's, it's okay, but the key thing you've done, or you've helped have done, or you've been part of, is that you've helped change the moral sentiment. And it's the overall moral sentiment of what people think is decent and just and right. And when that, when that alters, then you know you're on the way down. When you look at other human beings in your country and see them as human beings, and imagine trying to live with what they've got. And when you look above you, and you don't see them as demigods or celebrities and so on, 
the grape. You see them as they're like you. They're just wasting a lot more money than you are. And that's, that's the kind of thing you need. And you don't change the moral sentiment of, the, of a country without talking to your friends, neighbours and families. Because you know, that's where most people form their opinions about what is right and what is just and what is fair. Thank you. That's an excellent place to finish. Something we can all do. Um, so I'm afraid we're out of time for today. I'm sorry if we didn't get a chance to ask your question. Um, but Danny will be signing books in the foyer if you would like to talk to him then. Um, so the only thing that remains for me to do is to thank Danny Doling very much for his time today. Thank you.